So yeah, I want to thank um, the organizers for uh, this invitation. Um, yes, I'm an experimentalist uh, at uh, UMass Medical School. And um, uh, my group performs experiments on cells to uh, understand what being dead uh, really means. Hmm. Um, now, the question of uh, what being dead means and therefore what um, being alive means um, has fascinated many people over the years, including Kafka and, and Schrodinger. And um, these quotes and in our minds, we uh, associate living systems uh, as being dynamic in some very special way, even though we don't fully understand what that really means. Um, and my group um, wants to understand um, how these dynamics that we associate with life, such as a cell replicating itself, um, is possible, and why a living system uh, might permanently, irreversibly lose the ability to sustain these dynamics uh, of life. Um, and today I want to focus on one of those examples, namely how a cell can sustain its ability to self-replicate. And I'm going to talk about this um, in the context of the baker's yeast, Saccharomyces cerevisiae. And in particular, I will focus on how a yeast cell, um, uh, why or how it will lose its ability to replicate uh, when the temperature is too high or when the temperature is uh, too low. Um, in, by convention in microbiology, we um, say that a mi microbial cell is, uh, is dead um, if, for example, it's not able to uh, replicate anymore, uh, and thus uh, why one uses colony-forming assay as an indicator of whether a cell is alive or not. So um, in the interest of time, I will skip a lot of the data, but I'm very happy to discuss these um, uh, more details at the end. Um, so my talk is split into two parts. First, I'm going to focus on uh, how yeast replicates or not at, uh, at uh, sufficiently high temperatures. And uh, in the second part of the talk, I will give, uh, skipping a lot of details, tell you how yeast replicates or not at <laughs> temperatures. Um, and uh, most importantly, I, I should say, uh, both of these studies were led by really a remarkable former student of mine, um, Diedrich Blaman Tripp. Um, I did nothing, <laughs> so I'm just talking about it here. Um, and so it was very fortunate for me to uh, learn and work uh, with Diedrich. Okay, so let me uh, first um, talk about ha what happens at high temperatures. What is even a high temperature? So um, both for Baker's yeast and, um, and and almost any microbe you can think about, the conventional view, the textbook view, is that basically. Uh, when the temperature is in the right uh, regime, we're in this habitable blue temperature regime in which cells um, autonomously grow and replicate. But once the temperature is sufficiently high, then we're in this uh, red unlivable temperature regime uh, where uh, cells don't replicate anymore and die. Um, and uh, in this part of the talk, uh, I'd like to re-examine this, uh, this picture. So um, in all the experiments that I'm going to show you today, it's all very, very simple. Uh, the way we grow the cells is like how anyone else would do it. We would put uh, yeast cells in this uh, sugar medium, liquid sugar medium. It will constantly rotate and mix. It's a well-mixing liquid. And in a typical growth experiment that we and others would do, what you would do is you would take a, like a plate reader and measure how cloudy this liquid culture is. Cloudiness, uh, namely the optical density when you um, measure that, say, in a plate reader as a function of time, you would get this kind of uh, curve. Uh, here, what, what uh, you're seeing is that the number of cells or population density uh, is exponentially growing, increasing over time. And this um, exponent mu is what we call the growth rate, and that is the inverse of the population's doubling time. Now, when we do this experiment with yeast at different temperatures and plot the mu as a function of uh, temperature, um, this is a, the upside down U uh, graph that uh, many of us are familiar with. So this is what we get. So we've reproduced it here. And basically what you're seeing uh, for yeast is that um, when the temperature in, is in this uh, blue regime, the population exponentially grows. But as the temperature is increasing towards uh, the red regime, the growth rate goes down and down and down. And once we hit 40 degrees Celsius, the population negligibly grows. Okay? Now, the uh, usual interpretation of why this happens is that basically as the temperature increases towards the red region, a lot of bad things are happening to the cells. Bad things like 
Um, certain key proteins are not folding properly. There are a lot of heat-induced damages and so on. And uh, it is said that whether a cell can replicate or not hinges on that cell's ability to use its own mechanisms to repair these damages. And basically, once the temperature is too high, uh, a cell is not able to do that and, and uh, doesn't replicate and dies. So um, this is uh, what leads to this picture. But uh, what Diederich uh, realized is that this picture, um, although it's evidently true because we've reproduced it here, is actually hiding a conceptual problem. And to see what that problem is, let's zoom into this uh, purple box. When we zoom in, what we see is that at 38 degrees Celsius, population is growing, but at 40 degrees Celsius, it's not growing. And this is um, putting us in a kind of a difficult situation, this binary classification of temperature that we're used to, because what it's saying is that, for example, if I say that um, 40 degrees Celsius is the lowest unlivable temperature, then I can immediately ask what happens at 39.99 degrees Celsius, right? By definition, that's a habitable temperature. There's a defined growth rate. Growth rate is going down towards zero as temperature approaches 40 from below. That means the inverse of that, that is the doubling time should diverge. So what would the doubling time of this population be at 39.99 degrees Celsius? Uh, a month, a year, 100 years? So it's, maybe it sounds very silly, but at least um, to, to my simple mind, this was uh, kind of a question that um, at least told me that I didn't really understand this very well. Um, and so Diedrich uh, and I decided to examine this um, just by doing a very simple experiment. We're going to repeat the growth experiment again, but this time we're gonna make two modifications. So first, instead of using a plate reader to measure optical density, we will use a flow cytometer to count the integer number of cells in a population over time. Secondly, um, unlike in usual growth experiments, we will um, start with widely different amounts of cells in the population, okay? at, uh, just before time zero. So when we do that, um, at the usual 30 degrees Celsius where uh, people usually grow yeast cells, um, nothing surprising here, no matter how many cells uh, you start out with, they all exponentially grow until they plateau, until a carrying capacity is reached because nutrients run out. Okay. But now let's examine this 38 uh, degrees Celsius, the habitable temperature. And if we start out with 5,000 cells, we get this um, blue curve where um, um, everyone grows um, and um, uh, uh, until, until a carrying capacity is reached. Here's another one that's doing the same thing. Um, and here's all the rest. So um, because all of them always grow uh, exponentially until carrying capacity is reached, we say that they um, exhibit the usual picture and we say that, um, uh, that they grow uh, deterministically. Okay, now what happens if we start out with just five times less cells? So if we start out with 1000 cells, you see this green population. So there's a bit of a transient growth uh, near time zero because they came from 30 degrees uh, uh, just at time zero. So it takes a bit of time for them to use, get used to the new temperature. But once they do, um, after that transience, the, the population doesn't grow uh, at all. Um, here are shown for nearly 12 days or so. Here's another uh, population in green. You see that it doesn't grow for about eight days and then it takes off. Uh, here's another one uh, that takes off after about four days and here's all the rest. So here are these green populations, this ensemble of green populations uh, exhibit what we call random growth because a priori you don't know whether it will grow or not. And when it does, you can't, uh, we don't really know apparently when it will grow. And finally, if I start out with just five times less cells, we get this red population, which after transients doesn't grow. Uh, this one neither, and in fact, none of them grow. So these um, red populations exhibit what we would call uh, no growth behavior. Um, none of this should be happening at the so-called habitable temperature. Now, uh, at the uh, so-called unlivable degree, uh, 40 degrees Celsius temperature, uh, we find something similar, namely um, uh, red population doesn't grow, but if I start with just four times more cells, uh, that population will grow in fact uh, over time. Now, um, Diedrich repeated this experiment uh, actually quite heroically <laughs> at multiple different temperatures and initial densities. So this uh, simple looking uh, um, blue triangle means that there were at least 10 different populations that were tested there and all of them grew. So that's deterministic growth. Red means that none of the populations grew there. Gray is the measured carrying capacity. So that's where uh, uh, population plateaus once nutrient runs out. 
and here's all the data. Now, we can join the uh, outermost blue uh, triangles and outermost red triangles with one another. That leads to these uh, boundary curves and uh, results in a phase diagram. Um, um, now, uh, so blue just means that you'll always grow. Red means you'll never grow. Uh, random growth is, is, in, uh, is in green. So this diagram basically tells us that um, for yeast, it's not enough to know just the temperature to know whether a population will grow or not. You need to know how many cells it, it starts out with. So, so this uh, picture that we started out with is in fact um, requires a revision. Um, not only that, in fact, the uh, temperature is not a good measure of growth rate, it turns out, if you don't uh, control for density for a certain region of temperature. Okay. Um, so it turns out that cell replication uh, apparently depends on, um, on density for a given temperature. Is the same also true for death? And the answer turns out to be yes. Now, how do we determine that? It's very, again, a very simple experiment. Uh, we take a population, we incubate it at 42 degrees Celsius. Now this population starts out with sufficiently low density that it, it's not gonna grow. So the cell number can only go down over time. Now, what you see is that initially these, uh, what we do is we take up allopots from this population and put them back to 30 degrees Celsius and see if they can form colonies on an agar patch. So we, we count the number of colonies and from that, we can determine how many survivors um, exist in this population over time. And you see um, these uh, data points, they uh, fit an exponential decay for the first you know, uh, tens of hours. Uh, and that is expected. That's what you would expect if cells autonomously die. Um, but in fact, uh, at, uh, over time, you see that um, the single exponential, and with further work, work, we can show that even a biphasic uh, two exponentials is not going to describe this. In fact, the number of survivors is described by uh, um, a heavy tailed or power law uh, function. Okay. So the number of deaths is slowing down over time in a population, which is not what you're supposed to get if cells are autonomously dying. Um, but coming back to our original question, it turns out that the density does um, affect the, the uh, at least the initial death rate, which, which you can approximate with an exponential. Uh, namely, the, the more cells you start out with, the slower the deaths occur. Now, um, we can actually, in the interest of time, I'll skip a lot of details and say um, all this occurs because we discovered that um, once the temperature increases above about 37.5 degrees Celsius, yeast cells start to secrete a molecule called glutathione. This is a well-known antioxidant um, that, um, whose job is to uh, eliminate or reduce reactive oxygen species, which um, have harmful effects because they're very reactive, it damages cells. And what we found out was that once the temperature increases above a certain value, yeast cells secrete and accumulate extracellularly um, the molecule shown in green here, the glutathione which in turn reduces harmful reactive oxygen species that get created um, at a very high rate at these high temperatures, okay? So they're cleansing the environment, extracellular environment, it turns out, uh, of reactive oxygen species. Now, um, to be really more satisfactory here, what we decided to do was to build a, sort of the simplest um, model we could think of to try to explain the data I've uh, just presented to you. The model is, um, is a stochastic model. And basically it's very simple. Um, it, we, we take discrete time steps and in each time step, a cell can do one of three things. It can die, it can replicate, or it can do neither and just um, remain alive. Now the glutathione concentration outside the cells determines the probability of a cell replicating. So we start out with no glutathione in the environment. So the probability of replication we assume is zero at time zero. And then as the glutathione concentration accumulates, the probability of replication goes up nonlinearly. The probability of dying, of a cell dying in one time step, we assume is set only by temperature, but not by glutathione. So it's a constant, uh, the probability of dying. And then basically with this, you can construct a very simple model where we treat the number of cells in a population as the stochastic variable. Um, and the number of cells that replicate in one time step is, a, is binomially distributed with uh, this probability of replicating and uh, cell dying is again, uh, uh, number of cells dying per time step is binomially distributed uh, with this probability of dying. And now you can see here, basically when a population is incubated in a certain high temperature, a race basically starts. Uh, there's a race because initially the probability of dying is higher than the probability of replicating 
So the cells are dying off, but as that's happening, the cells are secreting and accumulating extracellular glutathione. And, and eventually they need to reach a glutathione concentration so that the probability of replication would match uh, the probability of dying and eventually go above that. And so you can imagine that if the population starts out with too few cells, the population would become extinct, everyone would be dead before the, the glutathione concentration would have, would have had time to accumulate to an enough extent. If the population starts out with enough cells, then it would go above uh, and in between is where, um, where we get these green population where um, whether the, the concentration of glutathione goes above the, the threshold uh, concentration that's necessary um, depends on the stochastic actions of a very few cells um, as the replication probability approaches the, uh, the death probability. Um, that actually explains um, all, the, all the data. Um, and uh, I think in the interest of time, I, I won't go through that now, but um, uh, yeah. I'll end uh, this part by saying that, um, that of course, uh, this is a phase diagram that's based solely on the glutathione that's secreted by the cells. But we could you know, buy from a store glutathione and just actually uh, give more glutathione than the cells can ever accumulate. And that actually uh, does lead to growth, for example, at 41 degrees Celsius. So you can shift the phase diagram. Um, OK, so um, I will now just quickly summarize some of the main ideas in the second part of the talk, which is what happens for um, cell replicate, yeast uh, replication at near freezing temperatures. So uh, by near freezing, yes, I'll, I'll my... tell you what that means. Um, oh, was there a question? Sorry. No? OK, so I'll just proceed. Um, <clears throat> long story short, um, we found similar effect, although um, there is an asymmetry between cold and high temperatures, um, um, which I might get into. Um, but basically, you can see here at five degrees Celsius. Um, so first of all, uh, you see that the time scale, this measurement goes for about two months. Um, and uh, so they grow really slowly. Uh, still, uh, it's measurable. Growth is measurable. So there is, again, a density effect. Um, and in this case, we used um, microscope to image single cells. So here, this is a result of monitoring um, individual cells in a population for about a month. And what we found was that um, when the, the, if the density is too low at five degrees Celsius, the fraction or the percentage of cells that divide is lower than the percentage of cells that die. Whereas if the uh, density is sufficiently high, then the percentage of cells that divide is higher than the percentage of cells that die in this isogenic population. The distribution of doubling times of individual cells however, is, um, you can see is, is doesn't really depend on the density. And that if you think about uh, the model I presented where the probability of replication depends on some secreted molecule, that probability determines the number of uh, the, the success rate of a cell dividing, but not necessarily the, the doubling time. Um, so that leads to a phase diagram here at five degrees Celsius. And according to this phase diagram, five degrees Celsius is seemingly the floor but it turns out, um, like I have shown you in the in the high temperature work, this is this is uh, an illusion. Um, we it, it, fundamentally the cells uh, can actually divide at even a lower temperature. Okay. Long story short, we discovered that yeast cells secrete and accumulate once the temperature hits below eight degrees Celsius. And uh, let me just show you that, for example, um, so um, in this case, I you know I've mentioned reactive oxygen species. So it turns out that you can, in fact, look at individual cells and using a fluorescent dye, measure how much reactive oxygen species there is. And basically what you can see is that in a population that doesn't grow, um, they, uh, single cells in general have higher amounts of um, reactive oxygen species compared to the ones that do grow uh, at the same temperature. Now, um, at five degrees Celsius, what uh, you can do is you can take this red population, which starts out with too few cells, so it uh, doesn't grow, but to the same population, we can at time zero add a very high amount of glutathione. And that causes these red populations to turn into the green populations that grow towards a carrying capacity. Now in these populations, we can again measure using a fluorescent dye, how much reactive oxygen species there is. And indeed as expected, the, um, the, the cells in general, when they grow have lower uh, intracellular ROS compared to the ones that are, uh, are extracellular. 
I mentioned to you uh, briefly earlier that there is some asymmetry between high and low temperature. One of the major asymmetries is that at low temperatures, um, it's the intracellular reactive oxygen species that really needs to be reduced, whereas in the high temperature work, it's solely the extracellular reactive oxygen species that's preventing the cells from replicating. Okay, and I won't go into the details here. Um, and finally, what we can do is we can um, artificially add more and more and more glutathione. So that's this x-axis here where my pointer is. And then um, that will cause more cells to replicate. And so the doubling time, uh, in fact, for the population will actually go down like so. So you can see that we can, first of all, make a population that doesn't grow, grow. And once it does, we can reduce, for example, the doubling time from about 10 days to about three days uh, simply by increasing glutathione. Um, we figured out where the ROS is mainly coming from, uh, for example, nutrients that are outside. Um, and um, I will just, in the interest of time, sort of summarize the remaining parts. So we've done some experiments um, at five degrees and one degree Celsius, um, and we've measured um, cell cycles, uh, and we've measured intracellular ROS uh, using microscopy. And what we found was that um, uh, the amount of intracellular ROS actually um, determines basically how long the cell spends in the G1 phase of the eukaryotic cell cycle. That is the phase where the cell is growing in size. And so the more ROS there is, um, the longer the cell tends to be in G1. And that is because we discovered that ROS um, prevents, it inhibits um, transition to the next phase of the cell cycle, which is the replication phase, DNA replication and segregation. So more ROS means that uh, cell is just in G1, it's constantly growing in size, and it's uh, not able to pass to the S phase. Importantly, what we discovered is that in order to pass to the S phase and stop the growth phase, uh, the cell needs to reduce the amount of intracellular ROS below some threshold concentration. It does that through glutathione, but also at low temperature by producing multiple different enzymes that are very crucial, especially at one degree Celsius. Now, all deaths result from microscopy images. We see that all deaths result from a cell becoming unsustainably large and blowing up like a balloon. And that's understandable because the cell constantly is growing in size in G1. It's, it's unable to exit G1. It's growing in size. And here, therefore, there is a race that occurs. As the cell is growing in size because it has some uh, intracellular ROS, it is trying to reduce the amount of intracellular ROS to go below the threshold concentration so that the cell can go stop growing and go to the S phase. And if it's not able to do that before the cell becomes too large, it will blow up. And that means that actually a cell cannot take an arbitrarily long time to progress through the cell cycle and divide at low temperature. There's a certain speed limit actually um, that, uh, that the cell uh, has to obey. So um, it goes without saying that, um, uh, that you know, if I asked you, can a cell uh, go through the cell cycle arbitrarily fast and, and divide, the answer is no, right? You cannot have a doubling time of a nanosecond and you don't even need to know what, you know, the mechanism. But if I asked you, can a cell take a year to continuously go through the cell cycle and divide, it's not quite clear why that shouldn't be the case. Um, in the context of low temperature for yeast, it turns out that that cannot happen. It, it cannot, there is some low speed limit, which is shown here by this uh, red line, simply because of the fact that a cell cannot become arbitrarily large and ROS is the main inhibitor of, of cell replication at, at low temperature. Um, so I will maybe just by end by saying the main thing that we discover is that there are these speed limits in particular, uh, what we call the low speed limit, sorry, that's the, the blue um, curve here. What we found was that as, um, so we found that there is no evidence that the cell cannot take arbitrarily long time to cycle through the cell cycle and divide, you simply do that by taking the temperature arbitrarily close to zero degrees Celsius. But the thing is, um, because we're doing single cell level measurements, we found that the probability of you actually observing such a cell replication is exceedingly small as, as we go towards zero degrees Celsius, because the probability of replication goes down, uh, down, down so much. And at a fixed low temperature, however, there is a speed limit. So at a given temperature, a cell cannot, yeast cell cannot take an arbitrarily long time to complete the cell cycle because it will blow up at a certain time. Um, so with that, I wanna thank um, 
uh, particularly Diedrich, um, who was in my lab when I, when I was uh, based in, uh, in the Netherlands. Um, and uh, I want to thank you for, for your attention. Okay, thank you, Brian. Okay, so yeah, you can see already uh, several questions asked. So I'll, um, yeah, thanks, right. <laughs> uh, so uh, um, I'll just read a few minutes. Um, so Robin Brusma uh, and actually uh, found ways to ask uh, two related questions. So I'll combine them. Uh, Robin asked, in the room temperature, uh, in the random regime for growth, could the onset time for growth be a new statistics? Uh, Fanway uh, asks the question, does the uh, death rate increase gradually or abruptly when temperature goes too high or too low, given the same initial population density? Uh, okay, maybe the second point. So if I understand correctly, is the death rate, uh, so the death rate for a fixed population density, I've shown that as a function of time, um, a single exponential doesn't do it. I guess the question is, is it um, changing from one exponential to something else abruptly, or is it continuously changing over time? Uh, if, if that is the question, the answer is it's a it's not an exponential decay; it's a power law um, or heavy tail decay, actually. Um, so, um, so I, that's the answer to the second question. So, it's not an abrupt change in death rate; it's a continuous change. I think the first question was, can we predict uh, when the green population will take off? Um, we could not get an analytic solution to um, to the model to determine that um, doesn't mean that's not possible. <laughs> yeah. So Robin so, asked question is this. Is, uh, uh, Robin, you want to ask by yourself? Yeah. Um, in our news, right? I mean, yeah, okay. go ahead, uh, Robin. Could it be that at the molecular level, there is some activation process which uh, causes the onset of the growth and will oh. the statistics obey such a molecular level activation process? So at the high temperature, um, it is simply the amount of extracellular reactive oxygen species and the amount of extracellular glutathione. We know it's nothing to do with intracellular because if you knock out importer of glutathione, uh, the same density effect holds at the high temperature anyway. Um, so I, I would say it's not the activation of some, yeah. Yeah, Thank you. yeah this is quite an answer. I think it's a kind of rhythm study people you know, think about the temperature dependence. Um, so let me see. Um, the next question here is uh, Ashok asks you, uh, 41 Celsius, uh, degrees Celsius doesn't sound like too high given ambient summer temperature in many regions. So he asked, are uh, there other streams or is that thrive in tropical countries? I'm sure there are, as there are also Arctic uh, yeast cells. I will say that um, the the thing is also in nature, they're not growing in rotating liquid cultures, right? They're actually in soil or something like that. And so, so it's the temperature, at this temperature, the, um, the nutrients that are in uh, growth medium produce a lot of uh, reactive oxygen species. So when we say uh, is 41 degrees Celsius considered very high or what is, what is considered high? High means that uh, it's the temperature at which the production rate of reactive oxygen species by the uh, actually non-carbohydrates in the growth medium are at a rate that is uh, much higher than the rate at which the cells can re uh, eliminate those ROS. That's de that determines the, that quantifies what, what, what is considered too high of a temperature for yeast. Yeah. Okay.